gotten to be so much fun and I've got nobody there now. Oh, you can see me. My husband is originally from Mendham. Okay. I want to see the whole thread. I can't see anything. Can you see me in there? I don't know what's going on. It seems like nobody can see me, right? But am I live? Okay, because I, I don't have access to anybody. It's not, I have none of the chats. If you can see me, I'm sorry, hold on just a second. I've got no information about who's here. Okay, Cynthia, I see you. Cynthia, do you think I started in a new window or I can't tell what happened, but I just saw a million comments that you were all saying good morning and I missed all of them. Um, okay. So I'm just going to go for it. I only see two comments and all the others went away. I'm so sorry. I wanted to say good morning to everybody as usual. Good morning, Cynthia. Good morning, Heather. Good morning, Kira. Good morning, Anita. Good morning, Jay. Good morning, Robin. Okay, good. So I missed all your previous comments. So if anything was super... Good morning, Robin. Good morning, Kimberly. Uh, thank you. Um, if any of your earlier comments were like super good, interesting, something I should know, something I don't want to miss, please let me know. Um, because I, I lost them all somehow, but at least I'm here and we got through. Uh, good morning, Joan. Oh, had to restart. Yep. Good morning, Catherine, Karen, Penny. Everybody's popping back. That's great. Well, good morning. How are you all on this Groundhog Day? Uh, we have got a serious blizzard outside. They have still yet to, uh, <laughs> thanks, Cynthia. They have still yet to plow my street, but I'm planning on leaving right after a coffee time to go to my workspace so I can get some of the kits out because there's so many people who ordered the Klimt kit. Um, so thank you so much. I'm going to get out to get those out before I fall behind. And it is Groundhog Day. Is it Groundhog Day in Canada as well? Because we kind of are in Canada this week with our adventures. Um, I don't think that Pugsatani Phil is going to uh, even come out of his hole today to contemplate shadows or no shadows. I think it's definitely a no shadows, super gloomy Connecticut day with a proper blizzard outside like we haven't seen before. I'm, I'm just completely uh, baffled by why the street is not plowed yet. I know there's probably lots of streets, but uh, second most expensive tax town in Connecticut, you would think that the road would be cleared in the middle of the day, but not this time. Good morning, Lori. Good morning, Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, I think you sent me that interesting note about Wikipedia, and I wanted to send you a message back to ask if you ever had made a post or an entry on Wikipedia. So let me know if you have, because I want to relay that information to somebody else uh, about that rug hooker. Uh, good morning, Mom. Good morning. I said, Lori, Martha, you're there. Okay, also Groundhog Day in Canada. Interesting. Anita, Janice, I'm so glad. <laughs> Six, I think so, Janice, at least six more weeks of winter. It is what it is, right? You, like the kids say at school, you get what you get and you don't get upset. Oh, boy. So a few things I want to say, and one of them, I was just reminded by the problems I have logging on, and maybe it's the weather, maybe it's the computer, who knows what it is. But I just wanted to put the word out that last week I was running around, uh, you know, one-legged paper hanger, I'm not supposed to say that, right? Moth in a, moth in a wool closet. I'll say that, right, Brenda? Um, busy. And I noticed that an email came into my Gmail, ribbon at gmail.com. And I noticed that the subject was about a dye recipe because I had put out the word, if you have special dye recipes you're willing to share, I would love to put a future bingo game together based on our own colors and possibly a book that we could all download full of our own colors, something that we could do for free and share. And one person did send information about a dye color and I have not been able to get that email back up. It's not in my trash. It's not in the inbox. I, Again, I don't know what happened. Um, so if, if it was you who sent it, because I didn't even catch the name, it was that fast, please resend it. I was so happy that somebody responded with a dye recipe and that I've been searching for it for such a crazy amount of time. It's just not there. So please resend Crystal. There you are. We've been going back and forth. Power is back. Okay. Yep. Okay. <laughs> it's just a crazy day. It's This storm really wipes people out. Um, I wanted to tell you a couple other things. I'm working on Trivia Night for Friday, which will be rug hooking images, and we're looking at rug hooking trivia and general trivia. So it'll be super fun, not for money, just for fun. I'm getting that together, and I should have the cards ready by Thursday, definitely ready by Thursday, if not tomorrow, um, for you to uh, load from the ribboncandyhooking.com page shop. Um, and again, those will be free. That's just for fun on Friday. Um, yeah, that'll be super. 
So I was working on this a little bit, being completely snowed in yesterday. I was working on this a little bit. I haven't gotten hugely far, but I got a little bit further. You can see I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming closer into finishing this. I just want to get it a little more finished before I take the pattern off of it because I fooled with the pattern. Sharpie on backing, direct fooling with pattern. So I want to be sure the pattern that I put out is the best uh, pattern and the clearest and the cleanest version of what alphabet soup can be. So you can put your own story into the soup. Uh, one of the other things that I neglected to mention yesterday, before we get back into Canada, because I am having a proper pig's breakfast in a good way. That phrase has lots of meanings. I am in there deep, digging, ferreting, truffling, doing all kinds of fun stuff, getting into that Canada subject, the Chetty Camp subject. And we're going to travel to that. But yesterday I neglected to say, you know, I also try to keep up with special days that are happening. Um, I, I think I acknowledged in a small way pop, National Popcorn Day, National Squirrel Day. I put out that free pattern that a lot of people downloaded. Um, and all of this month is, at least in the U.S., uh, Black History Month, or um, I think Black History Month. So it, I thought it was important to acknowledge that with rug hooking, too, uh, because I tend to go toward historic subjects, and I don't always do something that's contemporary or that fits what's going on around us. So knowing that... Oh, thanks, Jennifer. It has so many colors and swirls. Jennifer saying I nailed the tomato soup color. You know how the tomato soup, particularly if you put a little bit of sour cream or something in it, has all kinds of swirls going around, and that's what makes it good, isn't it? I was debating if I should put like little green things for parsley or chives. I'm open to suggestions on that. I've got a lot of color I'm dropping into the background, and green isn't one of them. So knowing that, uh, let me know if you think it needs green. I am, I am thinking about the possibilities of parsley. Never said that before. <laughs> Thanks, Martha. The animal crackers would be great too. The animal crackers would be so cute. I'm gonna do them just like the Barnum and Bailey shapes, kind of lumpy, um, nondescript shapes, but that's what makes them so uh, sort of iconic is their lumpiness. Oh, good morning, Sheila. I know, I got lost. I, what can I say? I got lost. I'm just like in, in the woods all the time when it comes to the computer. So this is Black History Month. And I wanted to put out a few designs that related to black history, particularly, you know, I always say I'm not a great feminist and I'm not. I love to take a free dinner. I love it when the doors open for me. I'm not super, I don't have a super heavy stance on that. Although as I get older, I'm starting to wonder if I am a feminist because every person who I looked at to do special images and patterns for Black History Month, they're all women. And I guess it's because when I hear an amazing story, his story from history that I want to depict as a as a rug design or a hook rug, um, I'm always more amazed when it happened to a woman. You know, I guess that's the thing. It's always a bit more surprising. So the first design I want to show you, I was working on three designs last night. I'm just going to show you one for now. And as the mon month progresses, I'll show you some of the other designs in case you're interested in these two celebrating Black History Month um, by doing some rug hooking. So the first design I pulled, I had heard this story um, a long time ago when I was a tour guide. I always went through New England every week for months of the year. And I heard this amazing story in Newport, Rhode Island, because, you know, I grew up mostly in Rhode Island. And I always stopped my tour bus there. We were there for the whole afternoon. At one point, I heard the story, an amazing story about a former female slave uh, her name was, let me tell you her name. It's a, um, it's a difficult name to remember. Let me see if I can pull it back up. Duchess Quamino. She was a former slave, and as was the tradition in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, slaves often took the last name of the family. In this case, she didn't, but they were often formally adopted by the family and were released from slavery and often lived independently or stayed with the family, and it was often a choice. And this is one of those situations where this woman in the 1700s, um, who was an ex-slave, opened her own business as a pastry chef and became extremely successful in 18th century colonial uh, Rhode Island, which was a very progressive state, right? The most progressive state during the years of colony before the revolution and before the country. Um, she had her own business and she was she her business thrived it was a pastry business and she was very famous for her recipe for a frosted plum cake super famous like she made money off of this and she became a well-known person in society and she had her own business this is just an extraordinary thing for a person at this time so i haven't been back to the studio because of the snowstorm i'm going to develop this a little bit more but this is the design i did for um, i think it's going to be called 
Um, Duchess Quimino is a little harder. I'm going to take the words out, but frosted plum cake. And I drew a picture of what I thought she might look like. Of course, she might be heavier if she enjoyed her plum cakes as much as I would if I was a baker. Um, but I put her in a, a traditional costume of the period, colonial period, 17, you know, she was born in like the early 1700s and she died in like 18, right after the turn of the century. So most of her life was spent in the 1700s. I put a bunch of plums on the inset of her dress. And, um, and a giant plum cake, as I imagined it might look, with plums all over the place. And then I put like a typical, like the kind of mural uh, with houses and trees and puffy clouds that you would find in a colonial house of that era. You know, people painted a lot of murals on their walls, and they looked like this. Um, what's his name? Kimball. Warren Kimball did a lot of this after, but they're almost always based on colonial murals that have existed for, you know, hundreds of years. So anyway, that was the first character that I'm taking out for Black History Month. Um, the first person that I just thought, that story is so special and should be s really celebrated. And as a pattern, I'm probably going to put an interesting border around it. But I thought, my God, a woman in the 1700s who is black, who has her own business, who is successful as a pastry chef, uh, her occupation is list listed as chef. I mean, that's extraordinary. That's, we should celebrate people like this. Um, and I love plums. So I thought that would be a great image to, um, to use. So that's the first of those. You'll see more of those as a month goes on, and I have time to work on some more designs. Now, we've been working out of this great Chetty Camp book. I think I left it over on the sofa, but I'm going to make a small departure today. Uh, we are staying in Chetty Camp, but uh, thank you so much. We are staying in Chetty Camp. Um, oh, oh, oh. Oh, Anita says, on Terriers, Wired in Willie predicts an early spring for 2021. Really? Now, in Ontario yesterday, you were having sun, right? Did you get hit with a storm at all? That is, that is, that is very promising. I will, I will borrow on that, um, on that lead and hope that we might get the same thing in New England. But um, we're going to stay in Chetty Camp today, and I am loving that book that I've been working out of. Um, I'm going to bring it out again tomorrow. It is so dense, and it is so rich, and it is so full of interest. It's full of details. I love, I live in the details and the little cracks and wrinkles of these stories. Uh, it almost, I'm in a part of the book where uh, chapter to chapter, it's almost going from one person's home to the next. People who were hookers and did this for a living or at least for a side job. Uh, going into their stories and their family trees, and it's so dense. Um, I don't want to rush it. I'm going to take my time getting back to that. But I left, I left those stories of the very early days of hooking and the early peddlers, and I took a detour this morning, uh, and I think this is going to is going to use our entire episode. So Elizabeth Lafour is a super famous rug hooker. Um, and I would, I don't know where she stands in Canada because I have not lived in Canada. Um, but I'm assuming, do people know her name generally as a rug hooker? Because it, it seems from everything I read this morning, which was so much in so many different places, that she was very well known all over the world um, for famous portraits that she did of celebrities and important leaders, uh, and also gigantic religious tapestries, like the one of the I think it was a crucifixion I put into the picture today. She also had the Last Supper. We'll talk about all that. But I really went down the rabbit hole in a huge way because she's from Chetty Camp. And when I realized, um, we were talking a lot about uh, the Trois Pignons yesterday, or, or Crystal brought it up, and I had in my head it was a region. Is it actually the museum? Is it is it a region and the museum, or is it just the museum? It's hard to tell that as like a outsider. The, the reference is a little bit hard. Um, because there is a museum called Trois Pignons, and that's where uh, a lot of the stuff is, and the website was there, and I got a lot of information from that. But let's look at her life for a minute, because this is another woman that has led an extraordinary life uh, and done amazing work, amazing strides in rug hooking, very different style than what we normally look at. Okay, so it's the name of the museum. It's not like the name of the town as well. Is, is, is the Trois Pignons in Chetty Camp? Is that the way it's set up? Yes, she's known to have been to Chetty Camp and her museum. Okay, so this is part of the, this really got me going. Mom, I hope you're ready to travel in 2021. Um, this really got me going, wanted to go, wanting to go on the Cabot Trail because the museum in honor of her, and I'm gonna get to that too in way more detail, uh, is part of the Cabot Trail. And when I also Googled the Cabot Trail, it seemed to me, help me out Canadians, it was not only stunningly beautiful in terms of landscape and variety, 
Um, but there was a lot of rug hooking interest along there. I kept seeing shops pop up um, that had pictures of the inside with stacks of little rug to hook, like big, big hook drugs, but also little coasters and things and tons of yarn. Um, it looked like an absolute, um, I don't want to make a religious reference because that would be sacrilegious, but it looked like a holy grail type place to be headed if you are a rug hooker. Okay, you are ready, Ma. I know you're so bored. We'll get those shots in the arm, right? We'll be good to go as soon as everything's opened up. Uh, but this whole Cabot Trail thing, I'm not done with this. There were so many things that popped up that are open seasonally on the Cabot Trail. No online stores. You've got to go to Canada and do the Cabot Trail to enjoy these days of looking at, uh, you know, the Hook, the Hook Drug Museum, uh, the Elizabeth Lafour Museum, all these little shops, all these little out of the way places that look like another time, another place in time. All I can say is, it, and not coincidentally, it just reminded me a lot of the pictures I was looking at were reminded me of the more rugged parts of England and Scotland, uh, very rugged, but very quaint, that funny balance between those two things, you know? Anyway, this is, I got this information from a website called uh, blog.myvideomedia.com. And then the back, this is tough, so maybe you rewind it. Um, I put quite a few links into the description of this video, things I'm talking about today, including the most wonderful um, sort of uh, maybe 1950s, 1960s black and white video of Elizabeth Lafour. It's a video about her. That's in the link of this description. It is exquisitely pretty, quaint, and interesting. You've got to watch it after coffee time. Um, but I pulled this off of this website, and it starts off very generally by saying, Chetty Camp is an Arcadian uh, fishing village at the Cabot Trail in Cape Breton Highlands, Canada. A visit to the Museum of the Hook Drug and Life, sorry, the Museum of the Hook Drug and Home Life in the building of La Trois Pignon should not be missed. More on that. Um, one of the other person who's represented in this museum is called Marguerite Gallant, and she ended up uh, moving to Connecticut. And she, from what I can see, is not a rug hooker, but she had sort of collections of collections. And her collections beautifully represented daily life in Arcad in, for the Arcadian people, so in the Chetty Camp region. And the rugs in the museum are Elizabeth Lafour's, but all the stuff in the museum, the collections, belong to this woman called Marguerite Gallant. So I'm going to try to come back to her in the future because she's not a hooker from what I understood. But she did have a beautiful life, and if you do visit this museum, you will see all of her stuff laid out, and it really enhances um, and really pops the look of the of the hook drugs because it's all the same period and it's all the same feel. So this is a picture of Elizabeth Lafour, um, the black and white picture on top, and you can see there she's at a Chetty Camp style frame, and she's hooking. She's got the Last Supper behind her. And she's hooking the boat, which is right here. So that's also at the museum. So let me show you her again. I mean, at least it looks Acadian, not Arcadian. I am so sorry, Betty. You are perfectly right. I think I said Arcade because the our mall in Rhode Island is called the Arcade. Isn't that awful? Acadian. I am so sorry. Of course. I think I probably put an R into all of the text that I wrote, too, which is going to further confuse me. Feel free to connect me every time I say something stupid like that. Thank you, Betty. Oh, Carol, that's a good question. Carol says, is a Canadian rug hooker travel guide available anywhere? Now, who's going to get going on that who's in Canada, really? We could really use like a rug hooking trail guide for, I mean, it's such a huge subject, and I'm sure it draws a lot of tourism. It would be great to know if one existed, even as an online page, right, that you could at least access it and make your trip according to. So many of us are in a point in our lives and with boredom, um, and also interest where we would want to make this trip. It would be great if anybody had any tips about um, some kind of a guide that set out to stores that are currently open because I also found a lot of places that weren't open anymore or at least the links were like, you know, when they show you like the paperclip or something and he looks like he's not doing well. Yeah, really good idea. So anyway, let's look at her life. Elizabeth Lafour, 1914 to 2005, was an expert in rug hooking and got famous when she began hooking portraits of celebrities. This commentary I'm doing is a real mishmash between quite a few sites, and I'll name all of the sites again. I cut and paste a lot of things together to make it uh, a bit more in-depth. 
Her works can be seen in the White House, the Vatican, uh, Buckingham Palace, right? So the toppermost, poppermost we're talking about. A number of their rugs are exhibited in the Dr. Elizabeth LaFord Gallery here at the museum. So this is the museum that we're talking about. When did the switch from wool to yarn happen? Kira, that's a great point. From what I'm seeing from the Chetty Camp book and from all the pages I'm looking at, it wasn't wool. I mean, they're using what was called, um, what did we call them yesterday? Crystal, what was that word that began with a B that I said, does this have a root in French? Um, scraps, um, the B word, not the B word, but the B word. Um, we'll come right back to that. From what I'm seeing, they went from using scraps to realizing that they needed that to using sheep because most families around Chetty Camp would be keeping sheep, not huge numbers, but some sheep. And they realized as time went on, they would take the best wool off the sheep um, to make clothing, right? Because it was ice cold. So they would make, the best stuff went to clothing and the wool that came off, for example, the legs and the belly parts that was like inferior wool, they would use for rug hooking, at spinning it into yarn, not into wool uh, to cut into strips, but into yarn. And then from what I understand from reading that book, what happened next was when rug hooking became such a big industry, they realized that for the, the rug would be better if the wool was better. And for the wool to be better, they needed more sheep, right? Because they still needed the clothing. So they needed more sheep. And at that point, I'll do more of that tomorrow with the Chetty Camp book. At that point, it became more of a big business. And they started to take on Scottish sheep from um, immigrants from Scotland who lived somewhat nearby. And then their numbers of sheep went up and they were able with more sheep to get more of the best wool because they needed to use it for both clothing and rugs. So that was a huge sort of shift um, in the history. But from what I have seen, it has been all wool from the start, all wool yarn. Lillian Burke, that's a good one. I'm going to go to Lillian Burke too when we get into the book again tomorrow. So all these history questions I'm going to come back to and start again at the beginning of them bending a nail into a hook. I just thought we'd take a departure today because Elizabeth Lafour is a bit cosmopolitan uh, and her rugs got so famous. It was a bit exciting to be reading about her. So um, she was born at Point Cross, Nova Scotia. In 1926, at the age of 12, she left school uh, to help out her family with sort of finances. They needed a bit more money coming in. So she left school and she decided to stay home and try to work on um, crafts that would bring in extra money. She had learned rug hooking already from her mother. So another page, um, I think it was Mary Jane, uh, maybe it was Mary Jane's rugs, uh, maryjanesrugs.com, the blog spot, had a beautiful thing on Elizabeth Lafour too. So make sure you check that out if you're interested. Uh, that Christmas that she left school, her family received a card from England, a postcard. It came from the mother of her brother's British wife. It was a typical English image, and it featured a little cottage near a creek with ducks swimming and sheep grazing. Um, everything was in brown, sort of monotone. Everything was in browns, um, kind of like a sepia card, not a full color card. I have, Betty. I've seen the tiny hooks. I need to, I need to start collecting things like this because it's so interesting to look at them. I would like to see more of the tiny hooks. Um, I had such a hard time tracking down the image of this, but I got there in the end because this postcard is a big turning point for her. Um, Elizabeth was convinced that she could reproduce this image from the postcard in wool. So she dyed 28 different shades of brown, right? People do this now, but can you imagine somebody in the 1920s taking this on with not very many resources, uh, not any sort of commercial dyes to help out? Uh, she completed the rug, and it was so beautiful that it easily sold for $25, just like that. Uh, more than twice the price of any other kind of a rug. For example, a geometric rug or a floral or a scroll or something like that. Picture rug based on this postcard sold for twice as much. So she thought to herself, okay, I, I might be on to something here. And she made six more rugs uh, with the same image. One of them is now at the Elizabeth Lafour Museum, uh, the Trois Pignons. So one of them is in there. It took forever to fi find this image. There was no image online of the original postcard. Uh, it's not a great image, but this is what uh, I'm describing. This is the one of the six rugs that she hooked after the postcard that the brother's wife's mother sent from England. I mean, isn't that something? That I mean, that is really something. So again, that is at the museum for one to look at. Um, Elizabeth showed particular proficiency um, in hooking 
goes without being said, right? And around 1940, she began following her own vision and design by meticulously copying um, not just that postcard, but other postcards and starting to do more photographic type work. Not, uh, not only was that rug an artistic success, it sold more for any tradition, more than any traditional design had sold. So other people are going to start to notice this immediately, that this is a real departure from the hooked rugs that we've seen up till now. She continued to hook rugs for sale in that immediate region of Chetty Camp for 14 years. Uh, during that time, she was discovered by the outside world because she did a rug of a horse, a running horse, in front of a typical farm field. This I could not find an image of. If you know of an image of this um, hooked rug that Elizabeth did of a horse, a running horse in front of like a farm field, please let me know. That's right, Kathleen. Please let me know because I would love to find this image. It just appeared, I searched every possible combo and it was just not there. But this rug uh, was so beautiful, it caught the attention of Kenneth Hans Hansford, who was the owner of the Paul P. Uh, boutique. And he was so impressed that he immediately bought it. And he immediately bought another rug that she did that was a setting sun. And I could not find that one online either. No reference to it at all. And after having bought the setting sun, he made a deal with her to purchase all of her future work. So she finds herself hired as an artist in residence at his boutique for $50 a week. That is a princely sum. It says the princely sum of, that is a princely sum. So she created rugs of lots of varieties, uh, flowers, pastorals, uh, birds, animals, lots of things. But um, Mr. Mr. Hansford knew and felt that she could do even better. And he kept pushing her creatively to go even further with her style, which was very realistic. And he asked her to do a portrait. This is his proposition um, of United States President Dwight D. Eisenhower. And she did. And it took her, how long did it take her? It was like no time at all. Oh, it doesn't say here. More on that. She, three weeks. She did it in three weeks. 160,000 loops. I'll show you the portrait in just a second. Two years later, they had an invitation from the White House to present her masterpiece to Eisenhower. And here's a picture of that event. How extraordinary is that? Look at the size of that. Look at uh, Eisenhower's face, too. He's really delighted. I know I'm going to get cut short here, and we'll carry on tomorrow. I'm not going to waste all this commentary because it's just too good. Um, so eventually, Elizabeth and Kenneth were married, so that's nice. A happy ending at St. Peter's Church in Chetty Camp. Simple ceremony uh, the day after Thanksgiving, 1967. Uh, she was 53 years old, and he was 62. The couple spent their winters in Arizona, uh, where Elizabeth worked her magic in wool during the winter months. That's a nice thought, isn't it? Her art was not only featured at the White House, she did other portraits, Queen Elizabeth II for the Bicentennial, Prince Charles, Pope Pius, uh, John XXII, Jackie Kennedy, uh, President Lyndon, Prime Minister Pearson. It just goes on and on. This is why her work is at the White House, at Buckingham Palace, at the Vatican, all over the place. She continued to create really grand size scale tapestries. Remember in past episodes of Coffee Time, I've said between French and English, we've gotten a lot of confusion in the early years of rug hooking because of the use of the word tapestries and also even more the use of the word tapis, T-A-P-I-S, because there there is a crossover where we are calling these tapestries, but they are hooked. So in the U.S., we wouldn't do that. Um, we would just, we would say hooked rug. Um, and that crossover over the years has created lots of confusion, but we are still talking about hooked rugs for sure. Very romantic. I can't imagine. Um, so she did a large series. She felt that God had really um, taken her on when she started to become successful. She felt that, she, that he was working through her and, and had given her this great gift and had pointed her in this direction where this would be her life's work. And he was her guide. Uh, so she was quite religious and she did lots of religious scenes like the Last Supper, like the crucifixion, uh, lots of um, themes of death and resurrection, um, and lots of scenes Canadian uh, depicting Canadian history too, not just presidential history. So much more on that. But in 1975, Elizabeth was awarded the honorary doctor's degree from the University of Moncton in New Brunswick. Um, the Elizabeth Lafort Gallery opened in 1983 in Trois-Pignons. A collection of 17 of Elizabeth's artworks had been stored at Trois-Pignons since 1981. And added to the collection were six other pieces that luckily Elizabeth and Kenneth were smart enough to hold on to because her pieces just flew out the door. Everything sold. They were, they were wise enough 
you know, thinking about the future to hold on to some of her important pieces. And those immediately went into the museum when it opened. Uh, Elizabeth, okay, 1985, Kenneth suffered a major stroke and was hospitalized for many months before being able to return home. And two years later, in 1987, uh, accompanied by her wheelchair-bound husband, Elizabeth was admitted to the Order of Canada. Kenneth uh, passed away later that year, and Elizabeth pursued her art until her death on October 10th, 2005, uh, at the age of 91 in Chetty Camp. So, I have so much more to say about Elizabeth. You can see I've got a, a bunch of my Mary Tyler Moore papers going. I got more news to report. I only got through a few. I want to show you a lot more images of her work, um, special things about her. She was like a machine the way that she hooked. This, I'll just say one more thing. This came off MaryJanesRugs.com. Uh, Mary Jane wrote, um, she, as in Elizabeth, was a prolific hooker and was once timed at pulling 55 loops per minute. That is 3,300 loops per hour. Yet she did such intricate and precise designs from landscapes, florals, birds, and animals. Um, this is a woodland scene that she hooked. And um, Mary Jane says in person, she said she, she I could, felt like I could almost touch these timbers and get splinters. So this is hanging at the museum. You see the little deer hiding? It's not a super clear picture to begin with, and I printed it from the printer. Let's come a little bit closer. But you can see, I mean, this is almost like Andrew Wyeth kind of detail. It's extraordinary detail. So let's come back to Elizabeth tomorrow. Let's, oh, tomorrow we're having our Zoom call. So look for that information on the Facebook group, uh, Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. Um, I'll also put it at the end of this video as soon as I log off. Tomorrow we're having our uh, Zoom talk, so log on if you want to. Thursday, I'm going to come back. I'm going to finish this segment on Elizabeth Lafour, and I'm going to um, conclude the sort of even more in-depth history of Chetty Camp. And on Friday, we have our special trivia night. So I'm going to make sure that on Thursday, I finish um, everything that I want to say about Chetty Camp, unless there's so much that it needs to spill over into next week. So much more to say. Never enough time. Uh, it's such a great chapter of history. It's Part of our rug hooking history, somebody wrote um, the other day on um, my, well, YouTube, and said, you're always talking about how rug hooking is a North American uh, tradition and, and was, you know, started in North America. What about Pragi, which we call Pradi in the U.S.? Um, and, you know, I'm just making the point that they are two different things. We do a lot of Pradi in rug hooking, but early Pradi tools, tools were also like sticking tools, not hooking tools. But we're talking about hooking. We're talking about making something that involves a hook and not a needle or a different kind of a tool. There are so many interesting chapters of rug hooking, and I will get into Pragi or Pradi too in Great Britain because that is another great chapter. But it is so much fun to go through this stuff together and make connections and pull names out of history and follow the trail as long as you can go with the names and for us to brainstorm together on this page in this way where we share information. Crystal, without some of your information, I wouldn't have gotten this far with this whole thing. So great. I hope it was a great episode. I, I loved it too, Mom. I love talking about this and we will come back to it. Look for that Zoom information if you want to get together and chat tomorrow. Otherwise, I'm going to be working on orders this afternoon and I will see you on Thursday morning, same place, same time, 1130 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, to talk more about Elizabeth LaFour, Ch Chetty Camp, and the history of Chetty Camp Rugs. Have a great day, everybody.